Welcome everyone to stakeholder management in the first 90 days on the job. So that's what we're going to be focusing on uh, for the duration of this class. My name is Samea. I'm a co-founder at ID8 Labs. I have about eight years of UX expertise across startups, consulting, and corporate. Uh, and I especially like to specialize in inclusive design for brands like Disney, Hulu, Marvel, and of course, ID8 Labs. So today we're gonna to go really quickly through a lot of topics around stakeholder management. This course is intended for folks who have gone through the design process to some extent, but who are unsure about how uh, processes work in startups, corporations, or agencies. So the topics we're gonna to cover today are cultural differences between startups, agencies, corporate, uh, defining what design maturity is and the extent of design maturity within different types of companies. We're going to talk about, of course, our bread and butter UX stakeholder management. We're going to talk about how to manage the design process within uh, a company and the expectation versus the reality of it. And then UX meeting facilitation and management, UX workshop management and facilitation. And of course, we're also going to talk about storytelling, shared design system management and collaboration and software development processes and collaboration. And then finally, I'm going to give you a blueprint of what to do when you're in the first 90 days on your UX job and how to approach that. What I would ideally like to do is uh, save questions after one or two sections. So I'm going through to go through one or two sections and then pause for questions. And I ask that you keep your questions to the topic of that section. And we'll address you know, other topics as we go through them. So let's start with UX cultural differences. Uh, UX cultures can vary between startups, consultant, co consultancies, and corporations. And there's, of course, different work styles that you can expect. So if you are working in a startup, you can expect to be a jack of all trades and work across multiple roles. So for example, you could be a UX researcher and a UX designer, and you could go through the end-to-end -end design process or you could be both a UX designer and a UX engineer and not only design the product in Figma, but also develop it. Uh, you can expect faster work in environments and startups. You can expect to work within two week sprints often or quick turnaround times that might even be a day long, two days, a few days. Uh, when we work, talk about consulting work, it tends to be in more distinct roles and teams. So you might either be a UX researcher or a UX designer or product designer or content designer for the consulting firm. And you might work within a team of other researchers and designers, uh, you know, to tackle these client projects. You might have anywhere between one to three projects at a time. And Consultancies and agencies tend to work at a medium level pace. It really just depends on the size of the agency. Some agencies can be very fast paced and you might have to work on let's say one to three client projects every one to two months. And then finally there's corporate where again, you're working in distinct roles and teams. So you might be a UX researcher, a UX designer or product designer or content designer. And you're of course working on internal projects usually one to two at a time. Corporate tends to go at a slower pace, but again, it depends on the type of corporate that you work in and you can expect to work on projects for one to two months, uh, especially in these really large corporations. And of course, you know, not only does the type of work change between startups, consulting and corporate, but also the type of work culture changes as well. Startups can have longer hours and lower salaries, uh, and they might try and offer you equity instead of a higher compensation or benefits package. In co consulting, you will have uh, billable client time where you're working on client projects during your 40 hour work week, and then non billable time where you are working on internal processes or projects or learning. So depending on the size of the consulting firm or agency, this tends to be an average salary with benefits, depending on the size of the company. And then finally, in corporate, you know, that tends to be the most established type of role. You can have one to two large projects every one to two months, and you tend to see higher salaries and benefits packages. So it's a much more stable uh, work culture. And so you might be wondering, you know, what does a day in the life look like for a small startup as a UX designer or researcher? So I'd like to make a distinction between the types of startups. Usually there might be work 
in a small seed startup. Usually small seed startups are funded by the founders themselves or through the revenue generated from the small business. And so there's not really much, um, you know, to offer or not, you know, diverse teams and large teams within these types of seed startups. So what you can expect is to collaborate closely with the founders within a very small team, anywhere between one to 10 people, where each person brings on an area of expertise. So you can expect to be the UX unicorn and you might be responsible for the end-to-end -end design process. This is again, the least stable role and depends on whether there's going to be additional funding or revenue coming in for that small seed startup or business. Oftentimes, you'll find seed startups uh, hire contract workers or workers who work solely for equity until they can kind of get their, uh, you know, eggs aligned in a basket or, you know, um, hit the ground running. When you think about Series A or Series B funded startups, that means that these are startups who have gone through multiple rounds of funding, usually in the millions of dollars range. And you will see that they have more complexity within their org structure. So you can work in a UX team or multiple teams. You may be working on one to two projects for different aspects of the startup product or service. And because they have millions in funding, it tends to be a more stable role. So you can expect at least, you know, a runway of one to two years for the startup before they might run out of money or have to, you know, go for another round of funding. And so then your job is sort of contingent on whether they get the next round of funding or not, or whether they're able to make revenue to um, sustain their business. So you can expect in a day in the life at a startup to work with founders and execs to scope projects, work in two week sprints, and then have clear handoffs to de developers or designers or other team members uh, when working on projects. When we're thinking about a day in the life of an agency, in, at an agency as a UX designer or researcher, you can expect to receive a client brief or project scope. And this is usually a client brief that's provided to the directors within the consulting firm. The directors uh, then assemble their design teams and scope a project timeline and deliverables with their team and their team leads. Then what you can expect is a kickoff meeting of some sort and check-ins. And these kickoffs and check-ins can be both internal and external. For consulting work, you tend to work internally first, and then you check in externally with the clients to keep them up to work, up to date on the work. And you can set up, you know, a way to track the progress of each client project. So you're trying to really ensure that all deliverables are created on time for each client project. And then finally, deliverables are created and presented. And this can happen through collaboration sessions, both internally and externally, before being you know, formally presented to the client teams. Sometimes you might work informally with a client team and then present formally to an additional client team or client executives. Um, so there's different levels of how closely you, you may, may or may not collaborate with your client. And then finally, a day in the life at a startup or I mean a large corporation as a UX designer or researcher. Again, you can expect a project kickoff of some sort. Uh, usually the manager will kick off projects for the UX team after scoping the work with team leads and executives. Then you're going to have a lot of internal team check-ins to track that project. And then based on those internal team check-ins within the UX research or UX design team, you might check in externally with other cross-functional teams like marketing, product management, development, design, to ensure that there's clear handoffs between the teams so that work can continue and progress in a timely manner. And then finally, those deliverables are created and presented first internally to make sure that you're covering all your bases and that you really pressure tested your deliverable and then they're presented cross-functionally, maybe even at the executive level after being vetted internally for thoroughness and clarity. I also wanted to quickly talk about design maturity at organizations. So you've now kind of got a sense for the different flavors of UX between startups, consultancies, agencies, and corporate. But there's also this concept of design maturity. Uh, some companies, regardless of whether they're startups or corporates, tend to be very design mature. Others tend to be very design immature. So what does a design mature work culture look like? At a design mature company, you can expect that there is a uh, 
design process that is made clear to all cross-functional team. And then there's a UX process in place for completing all project work. So you can expect that UX in some sense touches nearly all topics and projects. And there's a set process in place for how to collaborate with the UX team, whether it's UX research or UX design um, or content design. And there's also a great balance between innovation work and tactical work. In design mature orgs, there's a mix of the innovative new product or new feature work where you're working on new ideas. Um, but there's also this idea of really fixing the tactical and you have more tactical project initiatives that optimize current you know, features or products or product lines uh, to con continuously evolve and iterate on existing uh, elements of the company. So in terms of thinking about a design mature organization, UX initiatives tends to be scoped and vetted at an executive level. And then those UX initiatives are prioritized at the executive level, usually through a chief design officer or a VP of UX design who is in charge of UX leadership. So when you have UX representing the business at the highest level, you can be sure that uh, UX is um, you know, prevalent throughout the business, and that you can consider this organization to have, be design mature. What does a design immature organization look like? In terms of a design immature organization, there is no set or defined design process or a very loosely defined design process for work. So UX design is not really prioritized across all initiatives or might even be an afterthought because maybe the executives and the team leads don't find the value in it or don't understand the value of UX design at this stage. In terms of innovation versus tactical, there tends to be a lot less innovation around the product or service because there's just more of a focus on running the business. So that might mean more focus on sales, marketing, customer service, and engineering, rather than looking into actually making changes to the user experience or improving the product or feature sets in one way or the other. So if you're thinking of a scenario around design immaturity, you can think of, you know, UX initiatives being scoped and vetted at the customer service level or the marketing team level. And whenever a problem shows up, sporadically it's corrected and marketing or customer service might bring it up to engineering. So that's like a very design immature organization where there's no UX team in place. Um, it's really marketing and customer service that are sort of informally doing the UX research and maybe even the UX design work. And again, UX initiatives are just not prioritized at the leadership level. So that's, you know, an extreme level of design immaturity versus what we just talked about with design maturity, where there's a design process in place and design um, is really prevalent throughout the business. So I'm going to pause there to see if there are any questions. Any questions around the two topics we just talked about? Different work cultures between startups, corporations, and uh, consulting versus design maturity. All right, no questions. Let's talk about UX stakeholder management. Oh, okay, here's a question. How can you find out what the dis what the maturity of the company is? That is a really great question. So again, uh, Renee, you can tell sometimes by interviewing with the company to see and asking certain questions to the hiring managers at the company. You might wanna look up the company's org structure to understand, do they have design um, leadership at the executive level? Is there a chief design officer? Is there a VP of design who's really driving design from you know, a business perspective and ensuring that design is a large part of the business? You can check on the size of the teams within the org structure to see you know, if this is a large corporation, do they have a really established research team and a research operations team, or do they only have a few researchers on their team and a few designers? Because the number of researchers and designers also indicates a lack of maturity or the prevalence of maturity, design maturity within the organization. 
Um, so those are two ways to check the leadership, the org structure, the number of designers on the teams. Uh, and then finally, even at the interview stage, right? So you can ask them questions uh, if you were being hired at that company to see, well, what's the size of this organization? When did UX you know, start to become an initiative? Um, what's the history of the UX team and how did it come to be? Uh, so those are great questions to ask uh, during those interviews. Awesome. Let's talk about stakeholder management. Oops. All right, so let's talk about um, getting introduced to new managers in the first place. The best thing to do when you're getting introduced to a new manager is to establish personal rapport in a one-on-one -on -one call before a project begins so that you can get to know them at a personal and professional level and they can get to know your personal and professional background and your expertise outside of a project context. You're really at this stage just trying to be friendly, just establish you know, some sort of conversation and start to ask them for their communication preferences and their frequency while working within a project to also start to see what are their expectations of you, but also how can you establish your boundaries and really take the time to you know, have heads down time where you don't have meetings so that you can work on the project or being clear about when you would like to sign on or sign off into the project. So come to a compromise between their needs and your needs to really continue to optimize the work relationship. And that's what's going to kind of build a great relationship with your manager or other managers in the future. You might be working within your, your team and one manager, but you might also be working with other managers um, depending on, you know, the cross functions uh, within the company. Uh, and again, you need to really manage relationships and expectations with those managers. So again, discuss each of your ideas and expectations around the heads down time versus collaboration time. I really like to ask for a percentage. I'm like, well, what would you expect the percentage of heads down time versus collaboration time to be? Would it be 50-50? Would it be 70-30? And by asking them to give me a percentage, I think it quantifies uh, in their minds exactly what they're expecting and it gives you a clearer answer. I also like to ask about communication preferences, whether it's texting, calling, or video. So a lot of times companies use Slack or some other type of messenger uh, system. And some managers really like to you know, have daily texts or weekly calls and check-ins or um, some managers tend to be more hands-off and might expect a one-on-one -on -one call once every two weeks or even once a month, but might you know text you as needed depending on the project that you're working on. So again, communication preferences and frequency are both important. Everyone has different preferences. You will have to work around your ma manager's schedule. I like to really try to find out what are their heavy meeting days and what are days where they're more relaxed so that I can bring up certain topics to them. Uh, I like to, you know, tell them what I'm going to do for the week so that I can plan ahead of time and they can plan ahead of time and their expectations of me are clear. So they're not micromanaging me as much. And we should also talk about a scenario managing a tough manager. So tough situations can occur when there's a mismatch between your expectations and theirs. This might not always be malicious or personal, so it really just involves you being really proactive about communicating your preferences so that you can resolve any type of mismatch that comes up. If you sense any additional animosity or there's politics or pressures, start to understand what's expected of your manager or what are some pressures that your manager has in their personal life and their professional life and consider other stakeholder relationships that you can lean into or lean away from for, for like creating a more supportive environment for yourself. Sometimes that means taking a step back from other stakeholders. Sometimes that means leaning into their support. Um, so kind of evaluate for yourself. What are those cross stakeholder uh, pressures that are happening internally with the, within the company? And what does the company hierarchy look like where these pressures are you know, taking place and being trickled down or trickling up? And another aspect of working in a company for UX is that you will also get introduced to new stakeholders. Usually introductions to other stakeholders are made by your manager. So your manager might give you a list of people to reach out to when you first start your job. 
sorry about this. All right, that was actually pretty fast. <laughs> I'm glad that they resolved that really fast. So I'll go ahead and um, keep sharing. Let us see. All right, so where were we? Um, getting introduced to other stakeholders. Um, so again, these introductions are usually going to be made by your manager, uh, and they're going to, um, you know, give you a list of who to reach out to when you first join the company, or if you're getting set up with a new project and you've been at the company for a while, and you can communicate with your manager before you set up these one-on-ones with other stakeholders, because you just want to make sure that they're aligned with you, and they can maybe even give you a heads up on what to expect with certain one-on-ones from different stakeholders, especially when you're talking to people at the executive level. It's always good to go through your manager first and then their manager to make sure that you've really covered your bases before speaking with the executives because um, that's just one of those etiquette things within a company where you want to make sure your manager is aware of who you're talking to, especially if it's levels up from them. Uh, and usually a manager who appreciates auto autonomous team members will give you the green light to go ahead and set up those meetings. And again, when managing relationships and expectations with stakeholders, you should really feel comfortable with leaning into your manager to help you navigate those stakeholder group meetings and workshops. So what uh, a lot of you know times, what tends to happen is that you will set up one-on-one -on -one calls with your manager and team members to discuss how to manage certain stakeholders cross-functionally, or if you're in a consulting firm, how to manage client teams externally ahead of a really large meeting. And so all of you internally go in with a game plan on how to address these cross-functional needs or these client needs or executive needs. And so let's think through a scenario or how to really manage a tough stakeholder situation. Usually when there's a tough stakeholder situation, it means there's a chance to collaborate. So you can really discuss tactics to handle the project changes and stakeholder changes and expectations during the project with your team and manager, and then come up with a variety of options, create a plan to tackle these project or stakeholder changes. So an example to, you know, about like tough situations with stakeholders might be changes to start dates, changes to prototype release dates, changes in the leadership and a reset of expectations and priorities, which trickles down to your work. This might mean that you have to completely stop a project or a pause on a project, or that you might be, you know, very quickly reshuffled to a new project, which might leave you feeling a little bit disoriented. Um, so those are some of the situations that tend to come up with tough stakeholder situations. Same thing in consulting for clients, right? Sometimes client needs change, the client team itself has internal changes that are happening. And so that could affect the work uh, mid project. And you just have to be aware that the deliverables and the timeline are always flexible. Yes, you have scoped out a, work, a scope of work with your client, which you need to deliver on, um, but there might be leniency in terms of the timeline and movements in the timeline. And some tips to managing these tough situations, whether they're you know around stakeholders or your managers, is the number one thing is just don't take it personally. It's really easy to start feeling anxious or overwhelmed when you are you know faced with a really high pressure situation. 
But what I like to do in these situations is to, you know, find ways to self-regulate and then to consider the other person's perspective and pressures that they might be under at that point in time. So consider ways to thoughtfully and securely manage your stress first, take some time to breathe, meditate, step away for a few minutes to really make sure you're not taking it too personally and you're maybe coming at it with a level of emotional detachment and then ask questions on what you can do to help in that tough situation to alleviate it. So give your manager or stakeholders different options on what you think is possible. If you're seeing that they're getting frustrated um, or that they're you know, dealing with a lot of pressure from their leads and their managers as well. And there's also you know, a certain level of politics around tough situations. So if you're trying to really understand where your manager is coming from, think about the hierarchical pressures and frustrations within the org and what's going on with the org at a higher level, at the executive level, at the C-suite level, um, and what's sort of trickling down. So just be sure to keep track of that so that you know when there's times of stress within the company. And sometimes it might not be anything to do with the organization. It might be personal pressures and frustrations. It might just be a bad day from one of your team members or one of your managers. So getting to know your team members and managers on a more personal level is great as well, just to get an idea of what's going on in their life. And if they're having a tough day, how can you take something off their plate or um, revisit certain scenarios and situations at a time when they're feeling better or they're more willing and able to listen to your ideas and perspectives. So again, it's always good to take time to reset after a tough situation at work and really depersonalize or detach from the situation for a little bit as needed before returning to solve it with a fresh point of view and a fresh perspective. I'm gonna pause there for any questions. Any questions on what we just covered so far? Great. So next we're going to talk about design process management, how to manage the design process and the expectations versus the reality. So I'm just going to give you a quick summary of the design process and collaboration touch points. Uh, this is a really great view from Nielsen Norman of the design process as a whole, where you can see there's these three legs of understanding, exploration, and materialization. Uh, when we're understanding, we're trying to empathize and define. This usually means gathering context from executives and stakeholders to scope internal business and technical expectations. Then what we have to do is gather context from users and marry this with the internal requirements that we're hearing. So this is a mix of understanding the context from the user perspective, the business perspective, and the tech and operations perspective. Remember that true UX design and research is really interdisciplinary, and that's when we can come up with our best ideas and best scope work. When we get into the exploration phase, we're thinking about ideation and prototyping and coming to a compromise between user needs, business requirements, and tech and operations constraints. Yes, we need to solve user problems, but we need to do it within the constraints of tech, the tech and operations that exist within the company, as well as considering business requirements around monetization, uh, revenue generation, conversion rates, and so on. And then finally, we're materializing our ideas. So from concept and user testing, we're starting to go into the development cycles and implementation. We're gathering feedback once a prototype is developed, and then we're launching it uh, by making small fixes. And then post-launch, we keep reiterating on the product or the service or features or the product line. And so, the one thing to really think about is to start gathering stakeholder context and setting scope. Uh, so this starts at the executive and management level usually to uh, really align on business priorities for each year. Usually this happens in corporate, but even you know in startups uh, and consultancies, this tends to be a little bit more um, changing and, and evolving, uh, but at large corporations, it's pretty fixed. Uh, you know, management and leadership at the executive level have really clear priorities on what to expect for the year. Uh, startups that tends to evolve and the plan might change every couple of months. 
same thing with agencies, uh, but it's always kind of set at the highest level and based off of business priorities. Next, you'll have team leads uh, and, you know, who work with these executives to set up the design scope based on the business priorities and prioritize design projects. Uh, so they're taking all those business requirements and then they're cross-functionally collaborating between themselves. Development is talking to design, who's talking to research, who's talking to content. And they're all coming up with a plan to start to prioritize projects from a design, development, content, marketing, product management perspective as well. Once the team leads have figured out you know, uh, a scope for all these design projects, design projects are kicked off once all those stakeholder and cross-functional uh, expectations are aligned and noted, and then the green light is given uh, from all the cross-functional teams to start to actually implement these projects. So again, this is at the corporate level where it's the most formal process, uh, but there's more, a more informal process that takes place at smaller startups and businesses and agencies. Um, and it's, it's the same process, but just fewer people, smaller teams. When it comes to actually conducting the UX research uh, and gathering context, the UX research team likes to work with research operations and recruitment agencies to screen and recruit the right types of users within the scope of the project. So we need to make sure, given a one-month timeline or two-month timeline, that we're recruiting users, the right type of users, on time so that we can run our research and then deliver an insights presentation to our stakeholders. Then the UX is, of course, the research is conducted and synthesized before it's being reviewed internally by the team and then externally across cross-functional teams, executives, or even clients if it's an agency situation. Next, we're getting into the design ideation phase. Design ideation can be conducted both internally and externally. Sometimes we might run internal sessions based on findings and recommendations from the research. These internal stakeholder workshops kind of set the North Star or the, the direction and the guiding points for ideation based on internal requirements and needs. And then we might take the ideation externally to validate that with users to make sure that both user ideation and stakeholder ideation are aligned. So that's when we're starting to synthesize our design concepts and we're prioritizing and combining ideas. We're scoping down our ideas and then finally testing a few concepts quantitatively. Usually we might use something like A-B testing, concept testing or quant surveys to do this. And once the top concepts are you know, voted on and prioritized, then we start to pro pre prototype these actual concepts and start to implement some of our best concepts with the engineering team uh, and then start to get into expectations of what to launch and when to launch it. So when we're talking about prototyping, there's a difference between creating concepts that are low to mid fidelity concepts versus prototypes. And prototypes tend to be more in depth, especially high fidelity uh, prototypes tend to be almost a, a blueprint for the engineers to take over and understand every bit of the product that they need to develop. So in the case of prototyping, we really need to consider a variety of use cases during the high fidelity prototyping phase. And we need to evolve our concepts into fully functional designs, which means we're thinking about things like notification states, we're thinking about navigation, we're thinking about interaction patterns and clicking through different options. So it's not just about a basic flow or a basic screen layout, but it's about understanding every detail on the screen and where every click would land the user next. And that's when we're starting to now get into testing and development. So once a more fully fledged prototype is created, we're able to test that with users uh, and understand the usability quirks of the prototype so that we can correct them, go for more low effort iteration. So making small changes to the prototype before sending it off for final you know, prototyping you know, into the development cycle. So the prototype can then be developed within multiple sprints before it's being launched. And that's when we start to get into marketing, sales, and customer service, or the CX, or customer experience in general. So, you know, once a feature or product is launched, we might see that the CX cycle starts to give us feedback on how the launch is going. So we might then start to optimize marketing, sales, customer service materials, and experiences. And then CX really considers the user's 
pre-purchase and post-purchase journeys more thoroughly um, and gives us clues on how to best reiterate on our product or on the overall customer experience. Next, we're gonna talk about UX management and facilitation. So um, when it comes to managing UX research practices at the company, uh, what we like to do is, and I'm not sure why it's doing this. Give me a second. Ah, I see. It means that we often have to work with uh, research operations to really consider uh, you know, screening and recruitment. So in a more design mature orgs, there tends to be a research operations team along with a UX research team. And we tend to have to do for research operations, things like user recruitment uh, and user screening. And we also tend to work with multiple vendors on the research operations side, vendors for, you know, creating, you know, large quantitative studies or recruitment or user testing. So you might work with, you know, usertesting.com as a vendor, and you might establish a contract as a research operations team member. So that's kind of what happens internally for UX research practices to come about. UX research operations also manages all the cross-functional meetings and stakeholder timelines and sets up those meetings, um, as well as maybe even handling you know, external client meetings or vendor meetings as well. When it comes to managing UX design practices, there tends to be a design systems team that manages the overall design system, the style and the branding of each of these products and features. And then the design system team uh, is able to you know, give the rest of the design teams a method of adopting the design system for each of the problems they're trying to solve. So in large corporations, there tends to be teams that might only work on transactions and transaction flows, or teams that might only work on search or teams that might only work on uh, personalization. And so each of those teams are building very specialized workflows and need to draw from or pull from the design system that is owned by the design system team. So the design system team is really creating this ability for all other design teams to work within the design system so that the whole brand and style of those product lines, features, and products is all cohesive and unified under one brand identity. Uh, and so when you're managing and facilitating design team work, it means that you are um, really making sure that the collaboration between the design systems team and all other design teams is really clear and expectations are set and that there's an ability to work across Figma files um, to get what you need in terms of uh, reworking a design. So does anyone have any questions here? I see a few questions. Uh, how would you go? How would you say to go about trying to apply the design process for initiatives or teams that want you to rush or cut the design process? Uh, this would be for less mature companies or faster moving initiatives. I love how you framed this, Renee. I love how you identified that this is a problem that happens during less design mature organizations or faster moving companies like startups. Uh, in the case of, uh, you know, teams that want to cut corners, it'll be your job as the researcher or designer to educate your stakeholders on the importance of the design process and to explain to them both qualitative and quantitative methods that can help them reduce the amount of risk when it comes to launching a new feature or product and save them a lot of time and money and cost along the line. You can also make the case for added revenue. So uh, at... The, the level where you're trying to educate your stakeholders, you always have to frame it in terms of the revenue that they can expect to generate if you were to do it on their terms or your terms, your design process terms, and how the design process would lead to better outcomes, whether that's better revenue, increased conversion rates, time and cost saved. And to be able to make that kind of pitch, you have to educate them on qualitative and quantitative methods within the design process uh, that will help them um, achieve that business goal. This is something that is usually taught at more of the senior level. A lot of the senior level designers and researchers are the ones that are 
uh, educating their executives and so that the design team can go and do the work, right? But as a design executive, as a design lead, you might have to educate executives and stakeholders on what your design process is and why your design process is so effective. Um, so it involves sales and marketing and storytelling. Uh, and that is actually something that we cover in the four month live UX course. When we go through the end to end four month live UX course, we talk about qualitative and quantitative methods used to evaluate uh, uh, design and be sure of the success of both the problem side of things and the solution side of things. And as you get better at storytelling, you'll be able to make not only a design pitch, but also a business pitch for why your ideas or why your design process is going to be so effective. Another really good question, what are your thoughts on running a design thinking process within an agile or lean development environment? We're actually gonna get into that in the future. So hopefully that will answer your question, but if not, we will return to this question. So I will now talk about UX workshop management and facilitation. So there's different types of UX workshops to consider. One type of workshop is the stakeholder workshop where you will gain context, set expectations and scope around a project. Stakeholder workshops in corporate tend to be cross-functional uh, workshops across multiple teams marketing, product management, design, development, research operations, research, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and you sometimes, you know, stakeholder workshops for consulting could mean talking to multiple client teams and including multiple internal teams. So it might be a mix of internal and external teams at a consulting workshop for stakeholders. Next, we have ideation workshops. Ideation workshops can occur again, internally or externally with users and clients. When we have internal ideation workshops, we're really aligning cross-functionally on what are the best ideas within the realm of the business goals and priorities, as well as tech and operations constraints. And then next, we're going to users and clients to really identify, uh, okay, well, what's feasible now? Uh, what do we need from the user perspective? And then we also have deliverables that tend to be presented via an interactive mirror board or more of a conversational workshop style. So you can kind of think of deliverable presentation as conversational or a workshop as well. When it comes to facilitating a UX workshop, you should always allow for some presentation time to set up the context, expectations, and goals. So set aside anywhere between 20 to 30 minutes to talk through the context of the type of work you're trying to do. Sometimes that might involve uh, you know, talking about the context set from past meetings. It might mean bringing up some user research and market research to show and align on priorities for the, for the teams. And next, you can then allow for some collaboration time for ideation and idea sharing. So once context is set, you can have um, ideation time. I like to break down collaboration time into individual ideation where everybody's working solo to come up with ideas. Often they can be timed. And then we do group share outs. And this gives everyone a chance to explore ideas and everyone to express their ideas rather than the loudest person in the room taking up all the time and space and talking through all the ideas. So having a mix between individual ideation and group share outs tends to be the best way to gather the most diverse set of ideas. Once you have a group share out, you can start to, uh, you know, make sure you're voting on ideas and starting to synthesize all the workshop outputs and prioritize ideation or next steps. So again, wrapping up a workshop with very clear next steps on what to expect um, is really crucial. And then what we like to do after a workshop is usually, again, reassess all the deliverables that came from the workshop. And usually UX design or UX research is doing this and uh, synthesizing what the next steps and the best ideas are. So based on the workshop outputs, a new scope of work is developed uh, as these insights come out and then the design or research process can continue uh, with these insights from the workshop in mind. So now we're going to talk about UX storytelling and flash reporting. There's a different types of UX deliverables that you can present during meetings, uh, whether it's a client meeting in your a consulting project or whether it's a corporate meeting. 
Some of the deliverables we like to present to cross-functional teams or clients tend to be UX screeners when we're screening for users to interview, interview guides to show them how we go about our research and educate them on the research process. We even invite them to UX interviews. These interviews could be recorded or live, moderated or unmoderated. Uh, depending on the cross-functional team or client, certain clients and teams really like to be involved with the research so that they can synthesize the data with the researchers. And in this case, you might be presenting the affinity clustering from the research and synthesizing information with your client or cross-functional team members. Then the research team might go off and work solo on a findings and recommendations report of the research and then uh, deliver that you know, findings and recommendations report to the clients or cross-functional teams. Other deliverables that are presented are usually ideation workshop materials, like what kind of tasks or activities you're doing in the workshop, workshop results, and what came from the workshop can also be presented. And then you can, of course, always you know, present things like ideation, concepts, wireframes, prototypes, or more research-oriented deliverables like user journeys, process maps, service blueprints, and user types. Uh, so again, when we're thinking about a UX story format, the most common format for UX storytelling is the findings and recommendations deck. So typically a finding and recommendation is presented together within the deck. You might have one finding and then multiple recommendations and options to help solve that finding. So recommendations tend to be vague to ensure collaboration while findings tend to be specific to the research that was collected so that the team can ideate and build on the recommendation presented. So this is kind of the bread and butter of UX presentations. Another report presentation or format is the flash report. A flash report usually presents findings from a UX research perspective and invites the audience to collaborate on how to solve problems that were brought up in the research. So the findings are you know, talked by the research team and then everyone comes together to really think through, okay, what recommendations can we make? How can we change this prototype or this idea? And a flash report is usually done faster than the traditional findings and recommendation deck, which is why it's just a presentation of the findings. And it can take place or in a format of a Word document, a Miro board or Fig Jam board, because this is supposed to be a rapid presentation um, and storytelling technique for rapid you know, delivery. Usually with the findings and recommendations report, it tends to be more buttoned up. It's kind of used in consulting. You might take anywhere between one to two weeks to create this type of findings and recommendations deck and really polish the deck for clients or executives or cross-functional stakeholders. When we're doing a, a flash report, we're not worried about the beauty of the presentation. We just want to deliver insights as quickly as possible. So a flash report might be generated in a few days after the research is conducted. You might take one day for synthesis and one day for cleaning up a report before you present it to your stakeholders. And we can also, you know, talk through kind of the formats of these stories. A lot of times we like to create Miro and Fig Jam uh, visualizations to tell a story as well. So in addition to just talking about research insights in a recommendations and findings report or a flash report, we like to create certain visualizations to tell the story as well. When it comes to visualizations, this might mean user types, user personas, stakeholder maps, journey maps, process maps, service blueprints. It could also involve more project management items such as timelines, sprint planning, project outlines. It could also involve ideation from stakeholder workshops, user flows and diagrams, wireframes and screens, as well as low fidelity concepts. Does anyone have any questions here? Do you have an example of a report we can see? That is a good question. A lot of my work is confidential, uh, but what we do is we do present examples in our ID8 Labs four month UX course. Um, it really is so context dependent that I'm not sure it would be helpful to show you a flash report um, because you know there's so many different industries and so many different ways that UX evolves depending on the type of company. So just think of the flash report as something informal, something quick, um, something where you have a better relationship established with your stakeholders, whether they're external clients or internal cross-functional stakeholders. So they appreciate the rawness of the report because it might just be a Word doc, right? It might just have, uh, you know, 
a couple of sentences on different findings and insights. Or in a mirror award, it might look like a set of sticky notes and some sort of affinity clustering exercise. Um, so there's different ways, different design and research teams organize that type of flash report. Uh, in a findings and recommendations deck, which tends to be more polished, you might see a, a very standard format, which would be on the right side, you might see the visual or the wireframe or the screen that is being critiqued. And then the header might be the finding. And then you might see bullet points on multiple recommendations uh, that, you know, based on that screen or that um, visual that is trying to be corrected. So again, it really just varies depending on the type of research conducted. A findings and recommendations report for user testing is very different than a findings and recommendations report for discovery research. Uh, again, this class is more for folks who are have already gone through the end-to-end -end design process. So if you're unsure of what's the difference between discovery research versus UX user testing, I would really recommend learning the end-to-end -end design process. How can um, we help or influence those insights and findings to actually get into product development? So that's a really great question, Renee. Um, a lot of times, not all of your findings and recommendations are going to be uh, used within the development process. In consulting, we would often develop a report of over 20 findings and recommendations. And usually only the top five findings and recommendations were actually selected by our client teams to be implemented within the de development cycle. Uh, in terms of internal work at corporations, you might present a flash report, but what you might have to do is you might have more of a say if you're working in-house because uh, you can then, you know, hop on calls with the design team or work regularly on a one-on-one -on -one basis with certain designers to ensure that all the recommendations are implemented uh, within the design reiteration or the development cycle. And then usually research and design don't have much say on when things are implemented. All we can do from a design and research perspective is implement the changes to the prototype, but it's really up to development to make a sprint plan um, and decide on when to implement what feature. So we have less control in that area. But these are all great questions. Please keep them coming. Next, we're gonna talk about shared design system management and collaboration. So there's, again, like I had mentioned, a design team versus design systems. Design teams at corporations and startups manage the overall style and brand for those products, services, and product lines. They are, again, responsible for the universal updates to the style and branding across all products and services. And they create a design system that can be adopted by the other design teams for quick prototyping and implementation. So they tend to be, a lot of times you'll see in corporations that uh, a lot of designers go straight to high fidelity mockups from different design teams uh, because they have a really robust design system in place, right? If you are working for a company like Netflix, you might be doing more uh, high fidelity mocking up because the design system is so robust. You don't really, you would be actually working backwards if you were to try and build things at the concept level or the wireframe level. Um, because all these elements are already in, you know, created for you in you for you to use and come up with a high fidelity prototype. So I know a lot of corporations that work this way. When a design system is less mature and there's less of a design systems team to manage universal style and, and, and guidelines, that's when you might see that working at the concept level and the wireframe level is so important because you're probably evolving the design system as you're going. So there's a level of maturity to the design systems for, for different you know, companies as well. Next, we're gonna talk about software development processes and collaboration. So when we like to collaborate with software engineers, we have a certain process in place. Uh, what we like to do is go to dev sprint update meetings to help developers on use cases that come up or additional last minute design needs. Oftentimes developers might be in the process of implementing a prototype and they might notice a last minute user case that wasn't considered during the design process. So they might quickly hop on a call with the designer to iron out that situation or that use case so that they can continue with their work. And dev sprint update meetings tend to happen, you know, on a daily cycle or weekly cycle, depending on the team. 
Uh, Dev Sprint update meetings can also be used to keep track of prototype changes and updates for usability testing. Uh, so, you know, researchers can also get a download of what are the changes being made to the prototype so that they can better plan their user testing during the process. When we talk about agile software development process, we talk about faster, more improvis improvisational and flexible processes. We're also talking about issues that are tackled by the software team as they come up. So this tends to be more of an informal method used by startups. And there's very little documentation required when moving in this more fast, improvisational, flexible manner. So you'll see at a startup, you know, someone might quickly write a ticket for the software developers to consider. And it might be, they might say it's like a big ticket or a small ticket or a medium sized ticket. They might give a little bit of context and a screenshot, and then they might send it over to developers to get it developed that week. Uh, and so that's kind of the level of the pace that you know comes with more of an agile development process. They might even find someone to help them develop that idea within the day, depending on you know what's going on and what's priority. In terms of waterfall software development processes, these tend to be slower, more planned, and, and less flexible. So usually issues are tackled by the software team in sprint planning meetings and then prioritized accordingly. And then there tends to be, uh, this tends to be more of a method used in larger corporations where sprint planning, they might plan you know sprints weeks in advance. So you might have sprints planned for the next two, three months, which means whenever you have new ideas come up, you have to, plan for their development three months into the future. And that's why there's a lot more documentation needed. You need to be very clear on showing them the prototype, showing them exactly what you need because they're already so uh, you know, backloaded from, uh, from work that's coming up in the next few months. Does anyone have any questions there? All right, let's see. Okay, I see. Do you have any tips for dealing with devs that don't respect the UX design process and fight back about designs as they take uh, longer for them to code? That's a great question. I've definitely had that happen to me. I think in this case, it comes back to education as well uh, to really explain from a user perspective why this is important to implement rather than cutting corners. And so that's why setting expectations at the kickoff meetings for projects is really important. When you invite engineering into your kickoff meetings and into your design process, you're starting to educate them more and more about the design process and show them the value of uh, both design and research, not only from a user perspective, but from a business perspective as well. And sometimes dealing with stuck, tough stakeholders on the engineering side just means that you need to build their trust over time. So be prepared to maybe, quote unquote, lose some battles in terms of what like designs not being implemented thoroughly in the beginning, um, but continue to fight for certain recommendations where uh, you are able to show the value, the business impact of that work. And once the company stakeholders start to see, hey, okay, these recommendations are actually leading to increased revenue, increased conversions, increased engagement, then they start to have more trust for the design process and the design leads. So that's why I like to approach everything from a business perspective. If it moves the needle in terms of a KPI or key performance indicator, then it is valuable and you will gain the trust of those stakeholders over time. But there's also another aspect to this, right? If you're working with stakeholders who do not, as you say, respect the design process, that to me sounds like it is a fixed mindset. It's always good to work with people who have more flexible mindsets, whether they're executives, C-suite folks, managers, stakeholders, and part of what you're doing when you're vetting a UX job is seeing whether that job is right for you, right? Is that a good work environment to work in? And you're looking for work environments where people have more open-mindedness to the design process, where it is a more design mature org, or at least they're open to it becoming a more design mature org. And when you see more of that flexibility mindset in your stakeholders and managers, that's when you know that they will be able to respect you. When the question is worded as, okay, they don't respect the design process, I'm getting the sense that that was not the right project to take on or the right 
company to work for in the first place, if they do have a fixed mindset about design, if they aren't able to change their mind over time, then you have to really consider for yourself and your personal growth within UX, whether that's a company worth sticking around for. All right. So finally, we're going, we're almost at time. So I'm going to give you a blueprint on how to handle the first 90 days on the job. So what I like to do is have a to-do list for the first 90 days on the job. And I use this for my work whenever I join a new team. And it has always left me with success at that company. So my to-do list for the first 30 days on the job include setting up a one-on-one -on -one meeting cadence with my manager to establish their communication preferences as well. Once that one-on-one -on -one meeting cadence is established, I, it's very clear how I can manage expectations with my manager and compromise on their expectations versus mine and establish clear uh, communication pathways. Next, what I like to do is set up one-on-one -on -one introductions with team members and other stakeholders to get to know them work better. Again, like I had mentioned, it's always better to do these introductions before you start working on a project because then stakeholders get to like you for who you are and your expertise at both a personal and professional level. And they're more open to working with you on projects and they're more excited to work with you uh, because it comes from a place of likability. And then finally, I also like to develop a three month plan at a loose level to set expectations and understand expectations uh, in terms of what I need to deliver in my role. So during those one-on-ones, I like to talk to my manager about what they expect from me in the next three months and what I can expect in terms of projects that I would be needing to complete for the company. I also, during those first 30 days, are getting a feel for how the team collaborates and works on projects. So I'm really paying attention at team meetings, and I'm trying to see what the work culture is like and how formal or informal is it? How often do people collaborate internally versus cross-functionally versus externally with clients? Things like that. Then what I like to do between the next 30 to 60 days on the job is I like to become proactive with completing deliverables or working on deliverables. So this is me getting into the thick of all my project work. Uh, I also like to interview team members and stakeholders to understand what they would like, how they would like that project work delivered. Um, so I'm trying to get a sense of What's their, you know, storytelling uh, method that they really identify with? What kind of reports do they like? What kind of templates and formats do they like? Uh, how has, you know, design or research work been delivered to them in the past that has made it really easy for them to digest and understand? And then I also like to take my own initiative on projects as well. So I might be assigned projects by my manager, but I also want to show my manager that I can take on different initiatives. I can create new initiatives. So I like to create my own work and create tasks based on what I'm interested in, but also to show my manager that I take initiative. I'm excited and proactive about the role. Usually these initiatives I propose tend to come from meetings with my manager where I'm noticing gaps in the research process or the design process. And I'm noticing areas where additional help could be needed, but it just hasn't been prioritized yet. And this usually tends to really impress managers because they see I'm being so proactive and excited in my new role. And then finally, in the last 60, 90 to days, the, for those first 60 to 90 days on the job, I start to begin planning my next three months of work or responsibilities with my manager. Again, I want to make sure expectations are really clear and I want to be able to deliver on those expectations. I also start to ask for more opportunities to lead and you know, take initiative on other tasks. So again, I'm setting the expectations of wanting to move into a more senior level role within the year. And I'm asking my manager for a blueprint of how to do it, right? It's always good to get that information within the first three months of the job, because then you can have a essentially a one year roadmap on what you need to do and what you need to deliver. Uh, to your manager to kind of get that promotion, whether it's a title raise or it's a salary raise. 
And yes, that, that, that plan, that one year plan is going to change, which is why you do it in three month increments. But when you set expectations and tell your manager what your goals are from day one, your manager can also better help you reach your goals um, and be on your side about it and advocate for you throughout the organization or the company. So really start to think about this as creating a plan together for your promotion a year down the line, but also taking items off of your manager's plate, right? They are better able to help you if you can help them. So look for areas where that are their blind spots, that are gaps that they're just unable to complete or something that they need taken off their plate because you see that they, they have too much on their plate. And that's where you go and take initiative. So I'm going to stop sharing here. I see there's a couple more questions. Um, how do you, how can you get leadership or stakeholders to start activities to create uh, measurable business metrics or allow you to run benchmark testing to find those metrics before diving into new redesign products, projects and product updates? So actually in our four month uh, live UX course, we cover both the quantitative and qualitative methods needed to showcase a measurable uh, business impact. And there's different ways of doing it. At Sometimes at the junior level or the even the senior UX researcher and designer level at companies, you just don't have access to that type of data. A lot of times big corporations won't even, you know, give you their metrics, but that those metrics are being discussed at higher levels, at the management level, at the team lead level. Um, and they're just not available to you, unfortunately. So you might not understand where those business metrics are coming from, but you're getting work that is scoped for you. And you just kind of have to run the research and design activities, uh, you know, based on the scope that that is trickled down from the leadership level. And that just happens in more in larger companies, corporate companies, agencies. At the startup level, you have more access to those founders. You have access to, you know, talking to them and understanding where these metrics are coming from or where their perspective is. And at ID8 Labs, we actually focus on a lot more business prototyping methods uh, to really help founders think from both the business and design perspective. So there's qual and quant methods we teach in the four-month program that really uh, can convince stakeholders, startup founders, that uh, you know certain um, activities need to be run, and you're taught how to you know run the design process from more of a business perspective. You have to start to think like a startup founder, essentially. So in our four month program, you are thinking of yourself as the startup founder. You have to scope a project topic using blue ocean strategy, as well as understanding market saturation. What we like to do when we scope a project topic is find an invisible market and provide something at low, co uh, low cost that is of high value to our user. And we usually like to, um, you know, choose an undersaturated market. If we are competing in a larger market with that is more saturated, we are going to have a harder time. We are more likely to fail. However, if we find an undersaturated market or an invisible market, then we are more likely to succeed. Next, we do you know qualitative uh, data collection to really understand the problem space. So at this stage, we're collecting you know discovery interviews and observational studies to understand the the lifestyle, the behaviors, the attitudes, the values of our user, and then we could you know create a qualitative findings and recommendations report on what's the problem we're trying to solve. But from a business perspective, we don't want to just solve any problem. We need to solve the most urgent problem. Usually the most urgent problem tends to be uh, the, a problem that users needed solved yesterday. And if they needed that problem solved yesterday, then they are more likely to buy that idea or want to buy that idea. However, if it's a less urgent problem, they're not really motivated to urgently buy that idea. So you have to think from a business perspective when prioritizing a problem to solve at the research level and the business level. Once you've prioritized that problem, you can, you know, diverge, come up with lots of concepts, and then scope down your concepts from a business tech and operations perspective. So now you've considered the user perspective from a business perspective. Are people willing to pay or purchase for this idea? If the answer is yes, then that means you have a solid business idea. If the answer is no, it's not a solid business idea. It might be a community idea. It might be a 
um, you know, like a nonprofit idea, but it's just not a business idea. And then um, from a tech and operations perspective, can you build this in two to three months? That's what we define as our MVP or minimum viable product. And you, the reason you need to build it in two to three months is because if you wait longer, user behaviors change and you'll have to, you know, start the design process all over again. Uh, so we like to scope things down to a two to three month period. And at this point, we still have a couple of MVP ideas that, you know, are viable, but we still don't have quantitative proof to show an investor or business stakeholder which of these ideas is most likely to succeed in the market. So this is when we start to do something called pretotyping, which is more of a quantitative business method. And I think, Renee, this is what's going to really get to your question, uh, because when we do pretotyping, we put articulations of our ideas out into the market and we see how many actions we receive back. So if a user is giving us an email or phone number, that means that they are um, you know, excited about the idea and there's a passive level of interest there. Even better, if they're giving us time from their day through a product demo or an interview or a sales call or an event or conference, it shows they're willing to invest time in the product or idea. And then finally, if they put down a pre-order, then they're investing money in that idea. So the ideas that get pre-orders or uh sales calls are the ones that are going to be the most successful. And you can take that quantitative data to stakeholders to show that there's an actionable demand for that idea. So that's the prototyping concept. It's usually done at startups. It's usually done in more innovation think tanks at corporate. Uh, sometimes a workaround quantitative method is to run a statistically significant quant survey with all your concepts, but a statistically significant quant survey is nowhere near as impactful from a business perspective as this prototyping boots on the ground method. Uh, because in a quant survey, you're not getting actionable data back. You're just getting a check mark from users. Yes, I would buy this. And it's statistically significant data. But there's no business impact behind that quant survey. So this is a time to realize from a more of a senior business perspective that not all quant data is made equal. Certain quant data has a higher business impact value than others. So pretotyping has a much higher value than a quant survey or a conjoint analysis if you're in product management. Uh, and so it's you're looking not only for uh, like the type of quant data run, but you're also looking for um, innovation, right? Companies that do things like blue ocean strategy that run quant surveys, or I mean, prototyping techniques tend to be more innovative. They tend to have more open mindsets. Uh, they're not fixed mindset people. You're never gonna run across a team that has these innovative methods that does not respect the design team. So that's why we're focusing on this so that you can start to identify teams that tend to be more innovative, more flexible, things like that. Uh, and to answer your question, uh, the four month course is a part-time course and it runs, it's starting up in September and it runs on the weekends and you can expect five to 10 hours of um, work within the four month course. You can go to www.idlabs.co uh, to check out information in the curriculum. I also see another question. So can you elaborate further on different types of stakeholders? And since it's a catch term, maybe have an example. Uh, so yeah, we actually covered this already, Peter. Uh, stakeholders could be cross-functional stakeholders. So if you're working in a large corporation, uh, a cross-functional stakeholder could be a marketing team, a customer service team, a product management team, a development team, and team leads. Uh, and so different stakeholders from these different cross functions. If you're working in an agency, stakeholders could be client stakeholders. So you could have multiple client stakeholders from multiple client teams. All right. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, Thanks so much everyone for joining us today. And I think not everyone got the link to um, the website, but yeah, if you're interested in the four month program, definitely check out um, the ID8 Labs website and you can hear more about the four month program there. I can also give you a link to it real quick.
And I think, you know, this topic, stakeholder management, is a more advanced topic. Uh, so I would really recommend learning the full end-to-end -end design process before you get into more advanced level topics. Um, oh, and so Renee, you had one final question about design thinking in an agile environment. It really doesn't matter whether design is in an agile or waterfall environment. It's the same process. Design thinking could take anywhere between two weeks to two months to two years. And it really just depends on the scope of the work, right? So that's also another thing we cover at ID8 Labs. When you're working on scoping an MVP, you have to scope it for a two to four month or two to three month time frame, build time frame. And so you're learning to really simplify your ideas from a development perspective and a tech and operations perspective. But this also means that you have to simplify the business model, right? Uh, if you're building an MVP or minimum viable product, you have to make the most basic business model on how you can monetize the idea and build it with very little effort. But you also have to start to understand as your MVP or as your business model scales over time, as your business grows, um, how does your MVP scale and grow over time? So that's the kind of thinking you need. You always really want to think more from a business level. And then you can address the problems around development and breaking down the um, problem or the designs into a development process. Because without money in the business, you're not going to have any development, right? It's going to be a fixed product. So really thinking from a business perspective is going to help you open more doors uh, and influence not only the design thinking process, but make sure that the design thinking process has more of a value, more of an influence from a business perspective and from a tech perspective. And you're basically um, establishing respect, right? We talked about respect. So establishing respect for the design process and asserting that the design process can and will increase revenue for, for the company and that things should be built a certain way. And yes, this is all done at more of the senior level, but we do consider more of these concepts within our four month program, which is why a lot of our alumni go on to land mid to senior level roles after graduating rather than junior level roles. And when you start to understand these nuances, you're better able to you know, talk to different stakeholders. All right, so thanks so much everyone for joining. And, uh, Hopefully I will see you at another event. Thanks so much. Thank you everyone.